pelvic floor dysfunction has a high prevalence. In recent years, ultrasound has become a very useful tool in the diagnosis and follow-up of this condition. The introduction of three-dimensional ultrasound has allowed the visualization of the axial plane of the urogenital hiatus, which previously could only be seen on magnetic resonance. The safety, cost, and ease of performing a real-time dynamic study have made ultrasound the imaging investigation of choice for the study of pelvic floor disorders. This video aims to facilitate the methods for acquiring images to bring this technique closer to professionals with an interest in this field. The most commonly used probes are the high-frequency transvaginal probe and the abdominal probe, usually used in obstetrics, but used here transperineally. It is very important to sheathe the transducer correctly, ensuring no air remains between the transducer and the cover, as this makes assessment of the structures impossible. The transvaginal probe can be used for 2D and 3 and 4D ultrasound. It should be positioned at the introitus below the urethral meatus. The advantage of the transvaginal probe is that it functions at high frequency, allowing clear visualization of the structures close to the transducer. Its disadvantage is that when there is a prolapse of pelvic structures, the transducer is expelled from the introitus. The abdominal probe, used transperineally, also allows 2D, 3D and 4D ultrasound. It should be positioned in contact with the perineum between the labia majora. Although the resolution is a little lower than that of the transvaginal probe, it offers the advantages of having a greater depth of fill and being suitable for use in cases of prolapse. The two-dimensional plane of section in the sagittal plane is the same in both probes, allowing the user to see from left to right the pubis, the urethra and the urethral sphincter, the bladder, the vagina, the anal canal, the rectum and the lowest part of the levator any muscle. A fairly common error is using the probe back to front. If we do not see the image in the typical plane of section, we should consider this possibility. To ensure that the image expands from the pubis to levator any, and bearing in mind that the hiatus will increase in size when the Valsalva maneuver is performed, the study should be started by opening the angle to the maximum possible on the two-dimensional transducer. We aim to get the best image possible using frequency harmonics and grayscale gain and applying VCI and SRI if the machine software allows this. It is important to remember that if we have poor 2D imaging, the 3D imaging will also be poor. From the plane of section we have described, we can use two-dimensional ultrasound to assess important aspects, such as residual urine volume, the bladder wall, urethral mobility measure with respect to the pubis in distance or angle, the presence of bladder neck funneling, or the existence of urethral diverticula, amongst other things. As we said earlier, for the evaluation of prolapse of pelvic compartments, the abdominal transducer, used via the perineal root, is preferred. 
Once these parameters have been assessed on two-dimensional ultrasound, we move on to activate the dynamic three-dimensional ultrasound or 4D ultrasound. Again, the sweep angle should be increased to its maximum to ensure the entire urogenital hiatus is included. When this is done, we get four images. The left upper image shows the sagittal plane, plane A. The right upper image shows the transverse plane, plane B. The left lower image shows the axial plane, plane C. And the right lower image is the rendered three-dimensional image. It is important to check that there is no gas interfering with the imaging on any of the spatial planes. If there is, it will show as a filling defect on the rendered image. On the three two-dimensional planes, a box can be seen this is the ROI, or region of interest. The contents of this will form the three-dimensional rendering or reconstruction that appears in the right lower image. It is important that the green line indicate in its direction, which represents where we are looking at for the ROI content, is in the superior part in the sagittal and transverse planes. If not, we will not be able to understand the rendered image. The three-dimensional image can also be improved by combining different reconstruction modes – surface smoothness, minimum, maximum, depending on the patient's characteristics and the operator's preferences. At this point, the patient is asked to fully contract the pelvic floor muscles and we save the sequence. This sequence is formed of multiple volumes that can be assessed. We usually analyze the volume that has the maximum contraction. The same procedure is followed for the capture of the Valsalva maneuver. When we position ourselves in the volume that we want to walk from, we activate the ultrasound's ROI function to allow us to move the ROI box. To assess the area of the hiatus as well as any levator damage, we must reduce the ROI in the sagittal plane and orientate it in the area of the smallest dimensions. This is the area between the pubic symphysis and the most caudal part of the levator ani. This is usually achieved by adjusting the set axis of this plane. Once orientated, we can see the urogenital hiatus perfectly on the rendered plane. With the ultrasound measurement package, we can measure the area, the thickness of the elevator any, or whichever parameter we are interested in. To better assess damage to elevator any, we activate the TOI program, Tomographic Ultrasound Imaging, which allows us to make slices in the plane of our toys, as we would do with magnetic resonance. Since we are most interested in the axial plane, we will select plane C and rotate on the set axis to correctly position the image. We can separate the slices to the distance we need, usually 2.5 mm to diagnose levator evolution. For transperineal anal sphincter studies, we rotate the transducer 90 degrees for the two-dimensional image of the sphincter, activate 4D ultrasound, and ask the patient to perform the contraction maneuver. Once we have confirmed that the entire anal canal can be properly seen on plane B, we activate the tomographic ultrasound imaging on plane A. The image that we see is that of the anal canal cut along its axial plane, and we can assess the external and internal anal sphincters. 
In the upper left image, we can see the level of the cut and we can include more or fewer cuts, which can be more or less spaced out depending on the length of the canal. Finally, we should mention that ultrasound also allows us to accurately assess the tension-free tape used in incontinence surgery. We can assess this dynamically as the tape appears hyperechoic on 2D ultrasound and very well define it on the three-dimensional imaging. Ultrasound is an essential instrument in the study of the pelvic floor, not only at the present, but it will continue to be so in the future thanks to the unstoppable technology advances in the field of imaging.